Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our first, possibly only, maybe not, we may come back our full ring open day. It's fantastic to see you all here. I'm Andy Burnham from the Megalithic Portal, as you may or may not know. Our first speaker is Martha Lawrence from Buxton Museum. She is the Assistant Museum Manager and she is talking about the Bull Ring and some of its closest relations. Now, Well, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to start my talk with a caveat. Um, I know you shouldn't normally start a talk with something negative, but as a, as a museum archaeologist, um, that essentially means I know a little bit about lots and lots of different things. So I'm not a specialist in any particular area. So if, as you're listening to my talk, and I come out with some horrendous error or something that you think, oh, that was, you know, thinking like that, you know, people don't think like that anymore or whatever, um, perhaps wait till the end, but then um, <laughs> do feel free to, to share, and because I think we've got quite a lot of time for, for questions, I believe, after my talk, so, um, so I won't feel offended if you say to me, actually, no, that's not right. Um, so that's the caveat over with. All right, so um, the Peak District, it's got lots of prehistoric uh, circular monuments such as henges and stone circles. Um, some of the books I've read said there were around 40. Um, it's debatable as to which ones you count, um, which ones you don't. So you can see here, oh it's a little bit out of focus I think. So once it comes into focus, um, this is a plan from um, John Barnett's book on uh, the stone circles of the Peak District. Well, you can see here there are lots and lots of uh, different sites mentioned, and I've circled the two main ones I'm going to talk about today, which are the Bull Ring, um, which hopefully you know where it is, given you found your way here, and Are Below, which I'm sure um, many of you have been to before. Um, that's perhaps the iconic stone circle henge that we talk about, that we think of when we think of the, the Peak District and prehistoric monuments in the Peak District. And then I'm, I'll also mention a couple of others, but those will be the two that I talk about. Um, and those are those two are what we call henges. And forgive me if I'm telling you what you already know, but obviously I know it's a mixed audience. Um, the henges are usually defined as a circular or subcircular um, enclosure, so sometimes a sort of egg shape or oval defined by a bank and then usually there's an internal ditch. Um, sometimes it's external. I believe at Stonehenge it's an external ditch. Um, but it's usually an internal ditch and there's usually one or two entrances. And they usually enclose a fairly large area. Um, smaller circles um, where they think perhaps there wouldn't have been enough room for people to have had a big meeting are often called hengiform enclosures. Um, some uh, researchers have taken the measure of 25 metres in diameter as the division between what's a henge. So if it's greater, if it's bigger than 25 metres, that's a henge. If it's less than 25 metres, that's a hengiform enclosure. Um, although, again, that's a debatable thing. So if you take this definition, the bull ring and our below are the only henges in the Peak District that we know about. So henges were used for ceremonial purposes and as meeting places, um, and it's difficult to date them precisely, um, but they were built in the Neolithic to the Early Bronze Age period, so that's about 3000 to 2000 BC, or about 5000 to 4000 years ago. To go on to the bull ring, this shows you a map of its location. Um, you can see here it's, you've got the, you've got the A6 running um, up the middle and it's just tucked behind the school and the church here in Dove Holes. It's sited on the crest of a slight ridge um, so it could have been easily seen from a long way away but it's hard now to imagine you know, these views that people would have had in prehistoric times because it's quite hemmed in by the houses and the busy road that's running past and the quarries as well. It stands at the junction of three valleys and it, uh, it may have served as an easily accessible meeting point or trade centre for prehistoric people in the High Peak area. To look at it in a bit more detail, here's a plan of it. It consists um, of a circular bank and an internal ditch and it's got the two entrances it has are orientated north and south and this inner area 
is um, it's 53 by 46 meters so it's well uh, a very large area um, the origins of the name bull ring are obscure some people have suggested it was maybe used for stock control or perhaps bull baiting uh, but often with with these names um, it's difficult to know uh, where they've come from um, one of the big differences between the bull ring and Arbolo is that the bull ring has no standing stones in it um, or at least none remaining because it was first recorded in 1789 uh, by Pilkington, who wrote that all the stones excepting one are removed. So presumably, prior to, you know, or certainly in 18, uh, 17, uh, 1789 even, um, there was still a standing stone. Um, so uh, that indicates that there were stones in the past, but something's happened to them. Um, local tradition has it that the stones were used as sleepers for the Peak Forest Tramway. <laughs> but I've only read that in one place, so I'm not convinced. Um, perhaps uh, the, or, the Henge also used to have dry stone walls running through it, so perhaps the stones were broken up and used for that, or just in general, perhaps for, for building stone in the past. Um, so from that, you can see that the bull ring is, is, a, is pretty damaged, um, and I think that's one of the reasons it's perhaps not as famous as its sister monument are below is because it's sort of suffering a lot perhaps from sort of modern um, or not even just modern 19th century or 18th century interventions um, it at one point um, they even grew corn in the uh, western half of it um, in the later 19th century um, as you can see from this uh, plan here the northeast quadrant was used for a quarry um, and they found a human skeleton during the quarrying, uh, but no details of it were recorded. As I mentioned, there were dry stone walls around and throughout it, and for several years there were annual bonfires held in the bull ring. Okay. So it's a difficult monument to study. Um, certainly a lot of my research for this talk, it's been the excavation reports have kind of been, um, we looked, but we didn't really find very much. Um, kind of report. In terms of investigations, uh, the first ones were done in 1902 by Mike Assault and Ward, um, but they weren't published and the finds were lost. Um, they reported that they found several flint flakes and several pot sherds. Then um, in 1949, Alcott did some excavations and I've got some pictures of these here, um, and he was attempting to find dating evidence. And the only finds at the base of the ditch were bone fragments um, and an ox molar um, and some undecorated coarse buffware and pottery. Um, he also found a small uh, rim sherd of pottery, perhaps from a food vessel, and seven flints, but none were closely datable. So again, the dating, exact dating when, it, when the bull ring was built exactly remains um, still something to be investigated. Um, I have... Um, so I've also got some other further pictures. Um, this is obviously looking through the ditch, through the cut through the ditch. Um, I, I like the uh, chickens, if you can spot them, <laughs> around the archaeological site. Uh, and that's a third, another one. Um, the next major excavations were done in 1984 and 85. Um, but again, um, they didn't find any features that they could definitely date to the prehistoric period. Um, perhaps this is because of all the, the damage that has been done, all the interference um, over the years, um, but who knows. Um, and again, they didn't find any features such as post holes or cremations outside the entrance, which is unusual for a henge. But it, again, possibly they were there in the past, but have been... Um, destroyed. Moving on to um, Arbolo, which is the other Peak District Henge. Um, you can see it's uh, a bit more of an open setting than the bull ring. Um, this shows you a location map. You can see on the left that this road leads westwards to the A515, which is the road between Buxton and Ashbourne. Um, and this way it's to the village of Yulegrave. 
um, and it's uh, in a field, uh, in a privately owned, um, the access routes are privately owned um, to, get, to get to visit it. Um, it's situated high on Middleton Common, um, again on a slight slope like the Bull Ring, but this time with, with panoramic views. And the name R below is probably of Saxon origin and simply means the earthwork mound. If we look at the, ma the plan of, uh, of R below, again it also consists of an almost circular bank and a slightly oval internal ditch. This time the entrances are orientated northwest and south southeast, so they're not quite opposite each other. Uh, and the inner area here is 40 by 52 metres, so slightly smaller than the boring. There's also uh, down in the southeast corner, there's a, there's a bowl barrow, and that was uh, dug by Bateman, Thomas Bateman, in 1845. Uh, the big difference to the bull ring, as I mentioned before, is that there are about 50 stones at R below forming a rough circle inside the henge. Some of these are fragments of stones, so perhaps they could have been put together. So perhaps originally um, there were 41 to 43 stones in the circle. Almost all the stones um, lie flat um, rather than standing, um, but there are stumps in the ground that indicate um, that the stones were standing in the past and they would have stood about head height. Though I suppose that depends how high your head is, doesn't it? <laughs> um, there's another stone setting in the centre um, that's known as the cove um, and that may have been rectangular in the past with at least six stones but some of those are, are missing now. Um, abutting the bank uh, to the south-southwest is a low bank and ditch known as the Avenue, and that runs for 150 metres, then it reappears after a gap of 70 metres before turning west. So that indicates that perhaps our below was part of a, there was, or at least what's remaining, there's more of a sort of ceremonial complex there. Um, the dating at our below, we know that the Henge was created in the later Neolithic, um, and that the stone circles and the other stone settings, they're likely to have been put in place after the actual creation of the Henge. The barrow um, was built after the Henge as part of it, um, as part of the Henge bank was demolished to provide material for the barrow. Investigations at the Bull Ring. Um, the, just to mention, the historical nature of these photographs are because these are photographs mostly from our own collections, the museum's collections, which is why most of them um, are not modern photographs. This is, in fact, a photograph from January 1903, um, which would have been um, not long after um, the Henge was partly excavated um, by Gray. He excavated it in 1901-2, to and he found flints including tanged and barbed arrowheads and leaf-shaped arrowheads, and also the remains of some ox and antler. Um, it had been investigated before then, but the early excavations were poorly recorded, so we don't really know very much details about what they found. Um, the barrow, as I mentioned, um, was dug by Bateman in 1845, and he found a limestone, limestone um, cyst, so a box, a coffin made of limestone, um, that had burnt and scattered human bones inside it, and also two pots. Um, which are now thought to be later Neolithic pots, which indicates, rather than early Bronze Age pots, which indicates the barrow is perhaps earlier um, than we had previously thought. The majority of the henge remains unexcavated, um, but field walking um, over a number of years has revealed extensive multi-period flints um, in the fields close by. So it indicates used for a long time, um, lots of evidence that it wasn't just used at one point. And there was also a geophysical survey carried out in the late 1990s. I'm not going to say much about that because I thought I might leave more detail for my the subsequent talks. And just a couple more pictures. This shows you that it's really quite a substantial um, bank um, at R below. And this also photograph from the 1920s shows you that tourists have been visiting it for a very long time. So, 
If we think about um, the bull ring and Arbolo together, um, the, their scale, the size of them, suggests they were built and used by large populations. Um, one idea is that Arbolo um, served the southern half of the population of the limestone plateau, and the bullring served the northern half, um, if you take the river Y as the dividing line. No way of, of proving that, it's, but um, it's a possibility. Um, because, so, and this use by large populations um, is probably the reason that they're larger, rather than they're necessarily more important ceremonially. Um, and it's unlikely that there were further large sites elsewhere on the limestone plateau, um, simply because there's been no trace of them found, and given the size of them, the scale of them, it would be um, unlikely that they would have been completely wiped out by agriculture. Um, even the bullring has survived being messed around with quite a lot. Uh, so, just to finish, let's take a quick look at a couple of other stone circles in the Peak District. The first one is, is Nine Ladies, which is down here on Stanton Moor. Again, I'm mentioning this one because it's quite a, an iconic one, one that people have, have often visited. And this one, it uh, lies amongst trees, but again, it's high up on Stanton Moor, and it forms part of a line of ceremonial sites which cross the moor. It consists of ten stones on the inner edge of a bank. Um, this time the circle is 11 by um, 10.